So the study that I thought was one of the most extensive was one that was done um, on several types of animals with uh, different mescaline analogs. So they showed that um, basically uh, what is meant by analog is that it's a very similar structure to mescaline. You would just make a slight alteration in the structure and um, just see what effects change or didn't change. And so the animals that they used it on were mice, guinea pigs, rats, dogs, and uh, monkeys. And I thought it was actually, I don't know how they did it on monkeys. I didn't know that that was uh, ethically allowed. But um, So they did the physiological studies on the, all of those animals. Um, some of them that I referred to before, like slowing and speeding up with the heart and things like that, um, were done on these ones. But when they were looking specifically for hallucinogenic effects, they only looked at the dog and the monkey. And what they found with most of the analogs, uh, including mescaline itself, was that only the dog was responsive to it. And what they deemed were um, hallucinogenic effects, so you see like um, in their chart or whatever, like dizziness, and it's like trying to classify how an animal could show that it's hallucinating. It's kind of funny, actually. But um, they also speculated that monkeys might be able to hide it theory um, because they have that concept of self-awareness perhaps a bit more but regardless with the doses they administered they found one that mescaline doesn't affect these particular monkeys and that the analogs that they had created were actually much more effective at creating hallucinogenic effects in the dog at smaller doses so um, yeah, that's this point here and they were also uh, much more toxic when they were doing the physiological studies. And this is just uh, some other tidbits about peyote and mescaline that I figured I would include. So because they found that it goes back to 8500 BC um, in the US, they speculate that the oldest used narcotic by humans, it's, it's the oldest to date, that, that, that at least the paper that I found, show, so that could have changed since, or um, we just haven't found it yet due to other technical limitations. And peyote, the cactus, is um, actually legal in Canada. Mescaline itself is not, or the preparation. So like what Brian was saying, you know, you can have your plant for nice display or whatever, but you do anything with, um, they call them mescal buttons, so you basically just cut off uh, the cactus from its root and then it's turned, you usually dry it out and then it's turned a mescal button. And so if you prepare that in a tea or it, you, they see them drying out or whatever, then they lock you up. And the, the one thing I really want to emphasize with this was um, that because a lot of research, I think, hasn't been done like scientifically, there's been a lot of uh, equal, I would say, equal or more self-testing, uh, philosophical, anthropological published documents. So my personal favorites are um, this woman, uh, Kira Slack. She wrote uh, an article in National Geographic called uh, Lost Souls of the Peyote Trail. And Aldous Huxley wrote um, an extremely confusing essay called The Doors of Perception. But, you, once you like, once you take it in and digest it a bit, it actually is really profound. But um, so, I think that one thing we need to think about in when we're assessing drugs and compounds like this that have such intense uh, spiritual and cultural significance, that what are the effects that we can't measure? I think that we should at least be looking at them concurrently with science. So. Um, to conclude, I thought mescaline was pretty cool to, uh, to a lot of people, including hippieists. <laughs> and um, <laughs> and um, um, some work has been done. I, I think, um, I mean, I'm obviously limited in my searching abilities, but uh, whatever I did, you know, didn't turn up. Um, a, a lot for what I thought would be such a significant compound and way more work should be done like uh, 
San Pedro, all they have are paintings on uh, some pottery, you know, as a significance. Like, what about, like, just looking into that further, other distribution, other areas? I, yeah, I thought that a lot more would happen with that. And um, one thing that I kind of took home with me was that mescaline is one of uh, a few alkaloids, like I talked about before, like pelotine and uh, local fluorine that are all speculated to be used in self-defense, and yet mescaline is the only hallucinogenic compound found in peyote. Now, it's not to say, like, I had the other study that said you could produce mescaline analogs that had hallucinogenic effects, but those were not uh, the other alkaloids present in the cactus. So, um, basically, mescaline has had this um, profound cultural and social effect, I think, at least. Um, and the other compounds, the other alkaloids in it, like uh, lofoforine, is much more effective at self-defense, if you think about it. Um, all the cactus would have to do is stop producing mescaline and increase lofoforine, and then things not only probably wouldn't eat the cactus, they would probably actually die uh, immediately after eating it. And so I think it's interesting that the cactus still chooses to produce masculine. I think it is a choice. <laughs> <laughs> That's not to say they're coming after us, but oh well. Um, so yeah, uh, more research and yeah, just in general, I think more attention should be paid to it. And then I just, I have these references, uh, some of the, the major ones that I have, I have other specific ones if you want to pursue anything. Um, any questions? <coughs> Brian? What's the, the, the structure, the chemical structure of this thing? <laughs> I knew that I would get penalized for not including that. Do we have a marker? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I believe that what it is is this. So we have. anyone knows differently, please correct me, but I'm quite certain that's what it is. And I guess this is a good point, a uh, good time rather, to talk about the analogs that they used. So um, to change it up, instead of putting CH3 here, they would put hydrogen here. Um, I believe that sometimes they put chlorine here. And I should have uh, tried to copy the structure. There was one that was actually very effective. It was actually kind of insane how it ended up being like 17 times more effective, uh, hallucinogenically, uh, toxically. Um, yeah. Any other questions? I've heard references to Peruvian torch. Is that the same as the San Pedro practice? Probably. I don't actually know if that's the case, but I mean, that's probably pretty likely. As far as I understand, the, uh, the alkaloid content in between the two are supposed to be quite different. Between San Pedro and Peruvian Torch, that's the uh, interesting. What the difference is supposed to be. So they're actually, so they're two different species I, that they're referring I to? Wouldn't, have full trust in where I've read this, but that seems that's what I've read. Oh, okay. So just a lower concentration of mescaline. Well, I think now. it's. Um, I think Peruvian torch is supposed to have a higher concentration of mescaline and lower of the other alkaloids. Oh, I see. It's supposed to be more sort of balanced, I guess. That's really interesting. I didn't actually know that. But uh, yeah, again, so limited by my own searching as well as what's available. So, yeah, it's, it's not that easy to find, at least for me it wasn't, um, stuff on this one. Anything else? Um, so I guess it, it looks a lot like an echo of the um, but does it act similar to an echo I don't actually know the, uh, 
I, at least right now. I'm, I just wrote a midterm, so my, my mind is flowing with useless knowledge right now. <laughs> but um, could you remind me what a phenethylamine does? I, I don't know. You know? Oh, okay. Probably. Probably? <laughs> it, it is a phenethylamine. Yeah. So. Yes. But like, I think perhaps you're referring to a different... Um, any other questions? All right. Thank you for listening.